Hey everybody, and guess what today is? You guessed it, tangent line to a graph. Here we go, let's not waste any time. Three, two, one, let's do it. Alrighty. So, um, we learned uh, before how uh, the slope is gonna indicate, you know, the, the rate of change, or the rate at which something is, is increasing, the rate at which something is decreasing. Um, and for, you know, for a linear function or something like that, it's, it's easy. It's a straight line and it's got a constant slope um, and, and we can figure out what that slope is for something that's not linear, something that is to a higher degree. Um, you know, that slope is constantly changing. Um, so to find a specific slope at a specific point, um, you know, becomes a little bit more difficult. You know, if I just look at something like this quadratic here, the slope here is much more um, uh, steep and larger than will be right here. This is a little bit less steep, um, less large. Here, the slope is zero. It's going directly horizontal. And then uh, coming onto the other side of the quadratic, it's actually doing the exact opposite. It's going, it's a negative slope. Um, so we see that there's, you know, a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of a challenge because I can't just say the slope of this quadratic is this, uh, like you can do with a linear function. Um, so, you know, what we need to do is take a look at you know, where is the slope and what is the slope at a particular point in time. I can always find what the slope is at a particular point. Um, at one singular point, there will be one singular slope. Um, you know, that when that point moves and when that point moves somewhere else, the slope will change in turn. Um, but there is a way for me to find a slope at a point, which is essentially the tangent line at that point. Um, and you know, it, it can get a little bit confusing because we're going to use words like the tangent line or the secant line, um, and I don't want you necessarily to equate that with um, with the, the trigonometric um, functions. Um, we want to think of tangent in this case as um, you know, a line that is touching only at one singular point and you know blasting off in in um, uh, in parallel direction to that point, much like you would think in geometry. Um, with the tangent uh, to a circle. So, you know, with the, the radius of a circle, it's going to be perpendicular to that, and it's tangent because it only touches at one singular point on that, on that circle. So that's the idea of, of tangent that we need to be thinking about, not, not tangent in terms of, of triangles. All right, so let's go about kind of like the first very basic, very simple idea of how can we figure out what the tangent is at a specific point. Um, so what we can kind of do is say, okay, I know that the tangent line at a specific point uh, will have a slope. Uh, so technically, if I can figure out what the slope of that tangent line is, uh, that should be the slope of the actual function at that point. Okay, I mean, it stands to reason. Uh, and it should be that simple. So if I draw a tangent line through a specific point, say I want the slope at uh, x equals 1 of this graph, um, over a point there, draw my tangent line. Technically, I should be able to say what is the slope of the tangent line, and that'll be the slope at that particular point because that point um, passes through. Okay, well, um, I can kind of visualize and see that this is going over one and up two if I kind of count the points on my graph, um, and I can eyeball and then think, all right, visual approximation, and kind of seems like the slope of that tangent line is going to be two over one or, or two. So the particular slope at that one point um, of the, the original function you know, should be 2. And that's really not the most accurate way of going about something like that. Um, I mean, obviously, it, it, I'm guessing, I'm approximating. Um, there's always a, a, a better way um, than just approximation. So we are going to go back to the idea of limits. And that's how these two things connect. Um, this tangent line problem is a huge, huge piece of calculus, um, and and using the limits here is kind of the first step in breaking into um, the, the the analytic process um, involved in the, in the calculus of of finding the, the tangent line uh, at a specific point. So here's where things are going to get more symbolic and maybe a little bit more confusing, but hopefully um, not too much. You know. Basically, what we're going to do here is instead of looking at a tangent line, I'm going to look at what's called a secant line. Um, and the tangent line touched at only one point uh, on the graph, 
whereas a secant line is going to touch at two points. It, it's basically a line connecting two points on the graph. All right, so let's say I have this particular curve. Uh, a secant line could be any two points on this graph, um, and and then the line that it joins them. Now, we're going to do something a little bit theoretical here and think, okay, well if I choose my first point, and that's going to be you know some x value to the right and some f of x value up. So my coordinate point is x comma f of x. And that, that should be kind of like a simple understanding. That's just, you know, that's how we write a coordinate point. So I choose this coordinate point. And then the next one that I'm going to do is going to be so far, you know, h units. I'm just using h as another variable. Um, it's going to be, you know, eight h units away on the x axis. Um, and it's also going to be, you know, so much farther um, up on the, on the y-axis. Um, so the coordinate point up here would be, you know, that same x value, but plus the distance h that you moved over. Um, and here it would be f of x plus h. So it's not going to be f of x. It's going to be, you know, say f of x was uh, two. It would be f of two plus whatever the h value is. Um, okay. So you have uh, x plus h, and you also have f of uh, x plus h. So those are your two points. Now, if I'm thinking, oh, okay, I mean, I, I guess that, that makes sense. You know, I, I have this point and this point. I can kind of wrap my head around why I'm labeling them that way. How can I relate, you know, the change in height and the, and the change in, um, in, in run? Because that's what I need for slope. I need you know, uh, the change in y over uh, the change in x. So the change in the y values is, you know, here the y value is f of x. Up here the y value is f of x plus h. Um, so I guess the, the the change in that is f of x plus h um, minus f of x. Right? I mean, if I had a y value of five up here and a y value of three down here, the difference between the two would be would be two. So I would be subtracting them. Okay, so this is just the symbolic way of writing that. And then what about the change in the x? Well, over here my x value was, uh, was just x. And then as I moved over here, I added you know, h units. Um, so I have x, and I have x plus h. So again, I'm going to have to subtract. I'm going to say x plus h and minus uh, x. All right, so uh, on the bottom, what that ends up becoming, I mean, I have, a, I have an x and I have a negative x. Um, so really, I'm just going to have h on the bottom there. And this might start to begin to look a little bit familiar to you. This right here is something that we were doing, I think, in the previous video. Again, it's called the difference quotient. Um, and I was saying it, it's a very um, important equation in, in calculus because it is used for approximating um, the, the slope of a line at a specific point. Okay, um, so what we end up getting from that is that the, the slope m, if you're going back to you know, kind of algebra 1 terms, m uh, of the, that secant line, so two points on the, the graph that you're choosing and the line that connects them, uh, will be f of x plus h minus f of x over uh, whatever that h value is. Now, this is all, you know, theoretical. We haven't chosen points. We haven't, um, you know, picked anything. We're not talking about anything very literal yet. We're, it's just abstract. Um, and we want to continue that idea and not really try to think of it too, uh, too literal, because, you know, the the way that this works is you can choose any two points you'd like to. However, if those two points are very far away, like in this first image, you know, you see the tangent line doesn't really match up very well with with the actual line of the of the graph. However, if you bring those two units closer and that h value is smaller you're not moving over so far, those lines start to become a little more similar. Make that h value even smaller and, and it becomes even more similar until the point where that h value doesn't really even exist. It's so tiny. You're moving over so little that those points are almost right on top of each other. And that's where the idea of a limit comes in. Because I want to see what happens as that h value gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so small that it's approaching zero. And that is going to give me my best um, 
approximation, my best um, idea of what the slope at that particular point is. Okay, so what we're doing is we're saying, you know, this is the way that I can express the slope um, given a secant line. And what would happen as I look at the limit as this h value approaches uh, zero? Right, so that's the, the kind of thing that, that we're going to be working with. So let's try it out. Okay, um, I'm going to look at the function x squared. I think that's what we were just looking at before. Um, and I want to look at the point negative 2, 4. Okay, and I want to figure out uh, what is the slope of the secant line at negative 2, 4. Well, basically what I care about there is the x value. Right? Um, so the slope of the secant line we know is that formula we were just talking about um, where it's going to be over here f of x plus h uh, minus f of x all over h. Now this is kind of like the more confusing part is, is getting things into this equation correctly because uh, it can you know because you have x's and h's it can get a little bit weird um, this part right here, the f of x, that part's easy. You know how to say, okay, I'm not looking for f of x, I'm looking for f of negative 2, so I'm going to put a negative 2 in there. Um, in this one over here, you have f of x plus h. So that can get a little bit weird, but it's going to be alright if we just substitute um, negative 2 in for x. So what we end up with is f of negative 2 plus h minus f of negative 2 all over h. And hopefully that part's not too bad. This next part is when we actually have to apply the function to these points where it says f of something, f of something. So f of negative 2 plus h means that any place in that function where I have x, I have to substitute negative 2 plus h. Now this function is easy because it's just x squared. So technically it's, you know, this thing that I'm using here. Oh, that is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to highlight. It's this thing that I'm using here, negative 2 plus h, and that is what I'm substituting into this function, x squared. So negative 2 plus h squared minus, in this case, what I'm substituting is just negative 2, so negative 2 squared. Okay? Multiplying this binomial out, remember it's a binomial, uh, we'll get this, and negative 2 squared is 4. We still have a subtraction sign here, so minus 4 all over h. Okay. Now it's just a matter of combining like terms. And I'll get on the top negative 4h plus h squared over h. Now this is where our you know finding the limit uh, idea uh, comes into play. Because if I were to substitute, because I'm looking for the, the limit, rewrite that again, um, the limit as h approaches 0, if I were to do that here I would get 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form and I, I don't want that. So I have to do a, a diving out technique here and factor the top. I can factor an h out um, and then you know cancel that on both top and bottom. So all I have to do now is directly substitute into this negative 4 plus h. Okay, um, So you know now we have to just look at what is the limit as h approaches 0 of that negative 4 plus h idea. Okay, I direct substitute, put in a 0 there, my limit is going to be negative 4. So what that tells me is if I look at the function x squared, which is the function I was looking at this whole time, and I go to the point negative 2, which is right here, that the slope of this function at that particular point is going to be negative 4. Okay. Once we kind of get into the habit of doing this a lot, this process is going to seem a lot easier. But like I said, some of the more confusing points are when you're substituting values or um, replacing the actual function for the f of x plus h or f of x um, values in there. Okay, um, why don't we try um, something simple like exercise 7, which is just kind of like making an approximation. Um, and then we'll also go and try something more like what we just did uh, with exercise 11. Okay, so the first one's more of an approximation. The, sep the second one is actually using the difference quotient um, uh, to, uh, to find that, that slope. All right.
once you're done with that we can move on and we can actually look at finding um, a, an equation rather instead of just at a single point we can find uh, what's called the, the derivative of the function alright so uh, hopefully you've done those two exercises um, you're feeling pretty good about it uh, and now we can move on to okay I don't want just the slope at a particular point I want an equation that shows me the slope at every point which is what we call um, the derivative of a function All right. Um, now the derivative um, just a little bit of uh, notation for a derivative it's generally notated with this this right here f prime of x and that's the way that it is spoken f prime of x And what it's going to be is we're going to use this same difference quotient. We're still using the same idea. The limit as h approaches 0 for that secant line. I'm trying to get that h value as small as possible. But I'm not going to substitute in a singular value. I'm going to substitute in an entire function to try and find that derivative. Okay? So, why don't we try this function? It's going to be a lot more interesting than something like x squared, um, especially because we're not just putting in a singular number, I'm putting in the entire function. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to kind of do the exact same thing as I did last time, um, you know, with just a little variation. I'm still going to set it up the same way. I have f of x plus h minus f of x over h as the limit as h approaches zero. Um, but when I go to plug values in, notice here that my first part is f of x plus h. So that means that I'm going to use the function f of x, but instead of x, I'm going to have to have x plus h in there, wherever I normally would have had an x. So my function is 3, I'm going to switch to my highlighter, 3x squared minus 2x. Okay? So now where, where there were x's, I've had to put in x plus h in order to fulfill uh, this first portion. Now my second portion says just minus f of x. Okay, and that's easy. Minus f of x, f of x is 3x squared minus 2x. And then the h on the bottom, easiest part of the equation. Hawk a ducky, let's keep going. Now that we have that all set up, the simplification can, you know, start and hopefully these um, little binomials and the distribution there isn't too much uh, to deal with. I do have x plus h squared, so it's a binomial squared, and then that entire thing times 3. So what I get there um, is going to be, maybe I should circle these again, uh, is going to be all the way up to this part. And then the next piece that I get, the 2 times the x and the 2 times the h, I'm oh, sorry, it's negative 2 times the x and negative 2 times the h, gets me this. And my last part just comes down. Alrighty, with the negative distributed. Okay, so, so far, so good. It looks a little bit complicated, but, you know, we're making it through. Now the next thing I do is just combine some like terms, right? When I come over into this uh, this section over here, you know I have some two um, x and two x. Um, I have you know some three x squareds and three x squareds. Um, and after you know canceling out some things, what I'm left with is the six x h and the three h squared and the negative two h. Still all over h because the bottom is super super simple. Now, if I were to evaluate the limit as h approaches 0 now, uh, which would be my next step, I would get 0 plus 0 minus 0 over 0, and that's not okay. Indeterminate form, can't do it. So I'm going to dive out. I'm going to factor an h out of the top. It's going to get me an h over here. Uh, I can cancel it out with the bottom. So now all I have to do is worry about the limit of this simpler function, okay, as h approaches 0. Now what's interesting here is that not every piece of this has an h value. So when I put in a 0, it doesn't just zero out the entire function. Uh, what it's going to do is zero out simply this term. 
and what I'm left with is 6x minus 2. So the derivative of f of x equals 3x squared minus 2x is f prime of x, 6x minus 2. Okay, now what that is telling me is that I could choose any x value. If I wanted the slope of the line of, of this function at x equals 2, all I'd have to do is plug it in here. It will be 12 minus 2, it will be 10. Okay, so this is a function that's going to describe the slope at any given point of this function. Alright, and that is huge for analyzing graphs, especially you know, for something as, um, as simple as you know, um, velocity, acceleration, and, and distance. Um, it's one of the more, more common uh, applications of this. Now, what I would like is for everyone to try exercise 31, and that will be the end for today. Um, we will come into class, we will do a whole bunch more, and everyone's going to be masters of this. Um, all right, I will TTYL uh, my uh, BFFs. Peace out.